Hello everyone. Uh, sorry today's lecture is a little bit late. Uh, we're going to be talking about broaching, sawing, and filing today. So broaching is when you have a multi-tooth cutter and it is a single pass operation. Uh, this is uh, originally produced for uh, making internal keyways. Uh, so external keyways are easy. External keyways you can just always mill or use use different cutter forms for that in, in a mill. Uh, it works, works pretty well. Internal keyways don't work very well. So uh, broaching is a way of very quickly and precisely making internal keyways and internal sharp corner features. Uh, it's also used for making gears, splines, and all sorts of other things. It's more of a mass production process because tooling costs are high, as you will see here in a second. It could be used to finish holes, uh, you know, maybe in some applications. Uh, it's pretty easy to make round holes, but uh, uh, you might use a broach to finish a hole. Uh, cutting splines, especially internal splines, uh, broaching is a very attractive manufacturing operation. Uh, maybe some flat surfaces too. Again, there's, there's a good way to make flat surfaces and round holes nowadays. Uh, splines, there's not a lot of great ways to make splines. Uh, it's a fast operation, uh, low cycle times, uh, cutting speeds relatively low compared to like CNC milling or turning, uh, but you get a lot done in that 20 to 50 feet per minute uh, feed rate. Uh, excellent surface finish results, too. Uh, good tolerance as well. So uh, it sounds like it's all upside. The, the downside on it is uh, the cutter. So here's a broaching machine here. This is a two-head broach. Uh, so these are the broaching tools here, and you can immediately see why this is expensive. So uh, this is a very precisely made multi-tooth cutting tool. Uh, this has to be made out of a good material like high-speed steel, and it has to be precision ground to, to shape. And basically, uh, in this case, we're putting splines in this little hub. Uh, this is a pull-through broach where this thing gets started, and then something hooks it from the bottom and then pulls it through the part. And... Uh, the hole in the middle of this thing starts out as round, and in progressive steps here, this goes from being round to the final spline shape here. Uh, these things grow a little bit and get a little bit more shaped like the final product, uh, and so immediately you can see why this is expensive. This is a very, very pricey tool, uh, and it can't really be reground after it's done, so once it's worn out, it's, it's pretty well done. Uh, you know, maybe you could fill some material and grind it, but that would be expensive by itself. So uh, broaching, and the machines are actually pretty simple. It's a, just a fancy press, um, but the tooling is, is very complicated for, for a broach. Uh, here's a little bit better view of a broaching tool, and this would be for cutting splines here, where we start with a hole that's uh, slightly bigger than this, this pilot here, the front pilot. Uh, and then these get more and more, or sorry, less and less round and more and more spline shaped as we go on. Uh, there's a little bit of a height difference here. That's the uh, rise per tooth, which we're talking about thousands, usually, you know, seven, eight, or nine thousandths for external, maybe 10 to 15, 20 thousandths for internal. Uh, so if you need to remove a lot of material, if there's a lot of depth on these splines here, you really need a lot of different, different steps here in, in your broach tool. Uh, pitch is the difference between these. Actually, I have a better diagram for these terms up here. But uh, depth is the depth of the cutting of the, the lands here. Uh, L is this distance right here. Uh, alpha, the hook angle, that's the uh, angle at the leading edge. Uh, beta gamma, yeah, that's the back off angle. Uh, that's the angle at the back of the tool. And then rise per tooth is the, the height difference between from tooth to tooth. Um, you know, these things are fairly long. You can see they're expensive. There's, there's just no getting around that these are expensive. So these are used mainly in mass production. Uh, but for things like splines, there's no other good way to mass produce them. Um, you know, if you can cast them in place, great. But usually that's not strong enough or precise enough. Um, you know, maybe metal injection molding stuff like that. You, you might be able to get it for some parts. But if you need like a hardened steel spline. You pretty well need to broach it and then heat treat it. There's just not there's just not a lot of good ways to make internal sharp cornered features. Uh, rifling is done by a broaching process. Rifling in barrels is a broaching process. Uh, it's fairly fairly common. Um, making rectangular pockets, rectangular holes. Uh, that's with sharp corners. Uh, sharp cornered holes. Usually you need a broaching process to get them because you can't mill them. Uh, you can prototype some parts with splines with wire EDM, but that does not work for mass production. So it's a fairly, fairly common process. Uh, still chip removal, so the, you're going to get chip removal 
at multiple different teeth at a time. Uh, what this means is your cutting forces are very high and you need to have your workpiece very well supported. Uh, you need a very powerful press for this. Uh, the chips get stored in this area down here called the gullet. Uh, so the chips curly queue up in here and get cleared out once the tool has left the workpiece. So you're basically storing the chips as you go through. So you usually have some kind of cutting oil anyway uh, and then use the cutting oil to wash the chips out of the gullet. Uh, it's a single process operation so you basically pull the brooch through once and you're, you're done. I mean it's a single strike operation. Uh, rise per tooth for surface it might be really low. Internal broaching is probably the more common one nowadays. Uh, for splines and here you're talking about you know one to two thousandths maybe uh, for for internal broaching there so uh, not a lot of rice rice per tooth there right I mean you, that's why you need you know if you need to machine thirty or forty thousandths off you need thirty steps for this uh, chips are held in the gullet again so you have to have some place to put the chips uh, solid shell sections are really big ones but solid ones are probably most most common uh, high speed steel, most of the time for the material, maybe some kind of coating on it, uh, maybe tungsten carbide teeth, uh, that would be an incredibly expensive tool, uh, but you could replace the carbide teeth uh, as, as things wear, but again, it's incredibly expensive, I've never even seen one of those, but I'm, I'm sure for uh, you know, people that broach lots of internal splines and things like uh, automatic transmissions where uh, the, the planet carrier needs to be broached, yeah, they're you know Ford or GM or wherever they're making those things is is going to be broaching millions of these things, so they, they need to be able to replace the two tips on on teeth, the teeth on the broaching tools. Uh, you can do round holes, you can do squares, you can do keyways, you can do hexagons, you can do rifling, you can do keys, or sorry splines, you can do uh, internal gears for uh, like uh, planetary gears, doing the ring gear, which is an internal gear. Uh, broaching is a very attractive way of making that. It's like one of the only ways of making that. Uh, keyways, splines and gears, flat surfaces, spiral splines, barrel rifle. Yeah, I think I covered covered all that that thing. Uh, two teeth in contact at all times. Uh, in internal, you need to have the the something. You need to have. It needs to be centering, right? So you don't want it to walk as it goes down. So you need enough teeth in contact so the tool centers. Uh, again, high forces here. So we're talking 70,000 pound PSI to 600,000 PSI. So you, you need a strong press and also a strong part and a strong way of holding the part. And you got to be able to get through tooling in. So you got to be able to pull a brooch all the way through something. Uh, and then, yeah, you got you to gotta be doing this for mass production because... That's the only way to offset your tool cost, or doing be doing something that you can charge a whole lot per part, a whole lot per part, and you're talking potentially thousands and thousands of dollars for a brooch. Again, I'll post the links in the description. Uh, it's worth watching some of these broaching videos. Uh, pull up and pull down machines uh, like this. Again, it's pretty well just a hydraulic press. Uh, it usually has some kind of coolant nozzles on it like that, the coolant reservoir, something like that too. Uh, this would be the hydraulic pump back here. You get 36 to 72 inch stroke, 5 to 30 tons of force. Uh, you can do this in a regular press too. You can set up a regular shop press to, to broach. Uh, but for production, you need an actual broaching machine. Uh, here's a big vertical dual broach here. So you could do two different steps uh, on one part or do two different parts at the same time. Uh, surface broach. Here, and surface brooches are, well, I'd say, fairly rare nowadays. So surface broaching, there's, there's usually milling works pretty well for that. But you, there might be some things that get surface broached still. Uh, here's a big horizontal broaching line. And th these are getting really big and really specialized in big, heavy industry. Uh, here's a big horizontal surface brooch for broaching the uh, blade slots. Uh, in a turbine wheel so this is how the, the turbine so like in a gas turbine engine the the blades are usually you know on the higher performance end and the, the high temperature side they're monocrystalline material uh, and they're going to be splined into a hub uh, the blades will be some fancy material the hub will be something like steel or something like that or titanium that's not as fancy uh, and they'll be splined in and those brooches need to be cut though the the splines need to be cut with a brooch or straight splines and they need to be Broaching is really the only way of making them. Uh, so this is a machine for holding the, the blades and then broaching the 
It's blinds on them. Uh, chain brooch. Uh, these are really kind of interesting. That's, we're trying to find some videos on a, watching a chain brooch. So here we have our part on a big recirculating chain here. So the part will get loaded on one end of the chain. It will run through a series of stationary broaching tools here. And the chain will pull it past those. Uh, this is a line for broaching a connecting rod, a big diesel connecting rod. Uh, pretty rare. It's pretty hard to find information on these. I've never been exposed to one before. I've never seen one before. But uh, uh, it's pretty interesting. There's some, I've seen a few videos on them that are pretty pretty cool. Uh, again, very specialized, specialized manufacturing of this. Uh, sawing is similar to broaching. So here we don't have a difference in height on the, the teeth. Uh, and we essentially feed the part in and uh, remove chips in a similar way where we've got these little teeth we've got a gullet that uh, grabs the chips the chips get stored in the there until the, the saw leaves the part where the chips get fed out uh, sawing teeth will usually have a kerf on them uh, so the actual cut width is going to be slightly wider than the actual thickness of the saw blade uh, you need kerf to clear chips out and to reduce the rubbing friction from the saw blade on the, the workpiece if you've ever worked with a saw blade that's had the, the kerf the set of the blades taken out and uh, the set is the actual bend, bending of the blades themselves. The curves, the width, the set is actually how, how these teeth have been bent. Uh, if you screw up the setup of your bandsaw you can actually kill the set on your uh, blade and this will be basically straight and you'll get lots of friction and like cutting wood you'll get the wood to be smoking and burning and it's not good. You'll get a lot of friction in metal and it'll get really hot. Uh, so you need a set to the teeth that provides a curve where the cut width is greater than the thickness of the, the saw blade. Uh, three main styles, hacksaw, which is, it's just like a hacksaw, right? You go forward and then backward, forward and then backward. So it, 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 it's a sort of a reciprocating cut. Uh, bandsaw, which would be a continuous in one direction. And then circular saw, which is be in a circle. Or a cold saw, which would be a cut, a, cir a circular saw from metal. Uh, there's the regular standard or precision style of teeth, which looks like this. Buttress, it's got a little bit of dead space between the teeth. Uh, and claw tooth. Uh, these are more you see on, on wood in my experience. This you see more more in metal. Uh, different styles to sets. Uh, there's the raker set where you've got straight tooth, one this way, one this way, straight tooth, one this way, this way. That's pretty common for metal. Uh, wavy. Right, you see the, uh, that's progressively more, more set to the teeth. Uh, straight set. This is a good for finishing operation here on materials like aluminum, plastics, or wood. Uh, cluster has kind of a weird, weird repeating pattern here. I don't think I've really seen any of those. Uh, Raker sort of the general purpose metal blade, though. Uh, and then wave maybe for thin material. I don't think I've ever used a wave blade before. Uh, straight set for, for wood is pretty, pretty common. Uh, blade width, blade gauge, curves the width down here. Tooth spacing, that's the pitch. Uh, the gullet, that's where the chips get stored, tooth back here, tooth rake angle, uh, clearance angle, uh, gullet depth, things like that. It'll be, be important on, on specifying a blade. Uh, width, anywhere from, you know, I've seen blades that are thinner than a sixteenth of an inch, but sixteenth to two inches, I mean, a two inch wide bandsaw blade, you can imagine, that, that's a big bandsaw. Sorry, width this way, not thickness. I always mix those up. Width is the this, yeah. So sixteenth to two inch. That seems a lot more makes a lot more sense. Um, so for for like a horizontal bandsaw, you're probably going to use somewhere around an inch blade. Uh, on a on a smaller one, on a vertical, you'll be somewhere around half to three quarters of an inch. You know, for metal cutting, using a sixteenth width blade is not really going to work. For most applications, but for very precise wood cutting, you might use a blade that's down to a sixteenth. Uh, gauge this, yeah, twenty-five thousandths up to uh, a tenth of an inch or so. Uh, that's pretty common. For, for bandsaws, the saw blade's got to go around rollers, got to go around the, the the wheel, the the shoes. What are those things called? They're called a, uh, they're called wheels, and they got tires on them. The, the rubber part on the wheel is called a tire. But anyway, they've got to go around the the wheels on the bandsaw, and so they've got to be able to bend and flex. So you need really a flexible body and hard teeth, which creates an interesting problem for material selection. Uh, three to twenty-four teeth per inch. Uh, that's the pitch is going to determine tooth size. Uh, so the lower the pitch, the more teeth. So the lower the pitch, the fewer teeth per inch, the bigger the teeth are going to be. 
Uh, that's also going to change the gullet size and how many teeth are in contact with the work at any, at any given time. Uh, so for harder materials, you usually use a, a higher pitch. You know, for steel, you're going to use a higher pitch uh, blade. Wood, you're going to use a, a lower pitch blade. You know, aluminum, you can get by with a lower pitch blade. If you try to cut steel with a really, really low pitch, low tooth per inch blade, um, it, bad things are happening. You'll know, break the teeth off, kill the teeth, or it'll just stop your saw if you don't have enough power. Uh, so your right, right size, right pitch blade for the right for the material you're using is, is important. Uh, hacksaw blades would be high speed steel. Bandsaw blades, uh, there's lots of different kinds of bandsaw blades. The cheapest ones are going to be some kind of uh, steel, uh, and then there'll be some kind of a heat treat that'll be done just to the tooth area. Uh, that's pretty common on cheaper blades where it's the same same material, blade, and uh, the, the backing, and they just heat treat. You usually have some kind of induction process to heat treat the, the teeth to make them harder. Uh, you might have a multi a bimetal bandsaw blade where the backing is some kind of a nice flexible steel uh, that's able to bend and conform around the, the, the wheels really well and then uh, bend as you're, as you're cutting and turning your part uh, and then have some kind of really hard teeth welded on in some, some method like electron beam welding. Uh, so that you know, gets more expensive and then you know maybe some kind of coating gets more expensive. Uh, carbide inserts. Then it starts to get really expensive with carbide, uh, centered on carbide or centered carbide that's been bonded on, uh, or or carbide replaceable inserts for really really big really really expensive saws. Um, see like big rock saws or big uh, trenching saws for like laying uh, big pipelines and things like that. Uh, it'll be kind of like a bandsaw that leaves big replaceable carbide inserts. Uh, maybe grit for some materials. Maybe diamond grit. Uh, you see some some uh, basically a grinding type saw blades. Uh, cold saw will be high speed steel or a high speed steel or some kind of a spring steel or something like that uh, blade with uh, inserts. Now you see that a lot in like wood saws. You'll see a, a steel backing and then it'll have little carbide inserts at the teeth. Uh, the nice wood blades are like that, and that works for metal too, where you have a have a you know some more appropriate flexible backing material and then you've got carbide inserts and for really big ones you might have removable carbide inserts. Uh, vertical bandsaw, pretty common, right? You know, the bigger, big ones and small ones, right? This is a bigger one. Uh, smaller ones, you know, it's one of the tools and after you get your mill and your lathe you need a vertical bandsaw uh, to have a machine shop. So uh, this, the blade, it runs vertically on it. This one's got a five horsepower motor for, for example here. Uh, horizontal bandsaw, that's, you need one of those two in your shop. So vertical bandsaw is mainly used for, uh, you know, for hand cutting parts out. Uh, you usually use a vertical bandsaw. Uh, you know, they make ones designed to run automatic and that, that, that run where you're not holding stuff with your hand like, like this one here. But the usual ones in a shop, the vertical bandsaw, kind of kid screaming in the background, sorry about that. Um, vertical bandsaw. You'll mainly use it in a shop situation. That'll be the one you use to cut things by hand. Horizontal bandsaw you use for cut off. So if we're cutting a big piece of stock down into a more manageable size, uh, vertical bandsaws are usually designed where you can turn them on. Uh, they'll have coolant, and you'll be able to change how fast they they lower. And uh, they lower usually through weight. So there'll be weights you can move, and they'll have some kind of damper on them that keeps them from moving down really fast. Uh, and you'll just basically turn them on and let the weight of the saw guide the, the saw through the material. And, uh, and it's really good for taking big billets of material and making them into smaller billets of material. So that's another important tool in most shops. Uh, and then they make, of course, big, gigantic industrial versions. You know, for cutting this huge billet here of steel down, they make a gigantic dual column horizontal bandsaw here. It's the same principle, just bigger and more powerful. Uh, and then you know, even bigger, right? Even bigger. They're cutting a truck in half. I'd never noticed that before. But yeah, here we're cutting a truck in half for some reason. Uh, and that's a bandsaw big enough to cut a truck in half. 30 horsepower motor. Uh, big, big wheels here, right? Big wheels here. Uh, circular saws or cold saws. Uh, which, funny story that I highly recommend you don't do. A long time ago, one of our machinists, Bob in the Mimi machine shop, we had a 
four by eight sheet of one inch aluminum 6061 that had been donated that we needed to make some wheels out of on the Formula SAE team. Uh, we needed to break that down into smaller pieces. And Bob, the machinist, just took a regular skill saw, electric circular saw for wood, and just a regular carbide tipped wood blade, and just walked up to that one inch plate of aluminum with a circular saw and cut it into pieces. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen a machinist do, and I would never try to do that again. But you know, at the end of the day, these metal cutting saw blades, they really are a lot similar to a real a uh, high tooth per inch count wood blade where you've got a, a steel backer and then carbide inserts on it. Now, you've got to be crazy to do that with the handsaw, but when you put that in a not, you know, handsaw, you put it in something like this, these cut metal really nicely. Uh, they usually work better with coolant. Uh, since why they're a cold saw. A cold saw is, you know, it's a relatively low temperature process, this kind of sawing, versus a hot saw that would be like a, when this is a grinding wheel and the surface speeds are a lot higher and you're really just abrading material away and you're, the, you're making, you know, it gets hot enough that the metal is actually oxidizing and, and makes form sparks. Uh, you know, that's what a regular chop saw would be more of a hot saw and then this would be more of a, it's cold saw, right? It's more of a sawing operation than, a, than an abrasive grinding operation. And again, they make big ones, they make small ones on this. They make, you know, ones that replace, they make blades that you can put in a regular chop saw and do this with. They make dedicated cold saws like this that have a gearbox that run at lower RPM. Um, you know, again, here's a big, big cold saw, big automated cold saw. Power hack saws, you don't see these pretty, I've not ever seen one. I don't know why you'd want one if you've got a horizontal band saw. Uh, but it's reciprocating, uh, again, less common today, I and mean, then I don't know how long ago they became less common. I've not seen one of these, and I have no idea why you'd ever want one of these compared to a, a modern horizontal band, so they're not that expensive. Uh, filing, same action, essentially, as sawing. Uh, you're usually doing it for finishing or just removing a small bit of material. So files are classified by their type, the cut of the teeth, coarseness, uh, and construction. Uh, single, pretty common for hand files, which hand filing really is the only filing that's that common nowadays anyway. You know, banded and discs are, aren't, just aren't that common anymore. And this is usually for hand finishing of parts. You know, back before CNC machines, CNC machines existed, uh, and things like dies, you know, steel dies were hand ground with a die grinder and then finished with hand files. This was more of a thing. But nowadays we do most of our machining like that with a CNC machine and even the finishing too. You might need to touch some things up with some of these specialized shape files. Uh, so and maybe for if you're doing a, a tool making shop, something like that, you need to have a good set of files. But most of the time we're talking about just regular flat files for knocking corners off things and deburring. Uh, they're single cut, double cut, uh, rasp style, mainly for wood. This doesn't work so well on, on most metals. Uh, Vixen cut down here. Uh, you know, single cut's pretty common. Double cut you see, see too. Uh, single cut's for usually for finishing here. Uh, different angles of the teeth here. You know, rasp or more. These are little spikes that have been punched out of the surface and then hardened. Uh, and that's for rapidly removed material, main, mainly for wood. And, and metal, again, we're usually just deburring or doing a little bit of finishing work. So we usually use a, a finer single cut or maybe double cut file. I haven't seen a lot of Vixen cut files. I don't know the pros or cons on them. Uh, different cuts, uh, smooth, second bastard. You can look these all up for the different, different uh, sounds like You can see this one here is a mill bastard. This is a flat bastard. Uh, flat standard here. Uh, again, usually for finishing, so usually you get a fairly, fairly smooth file for, for most operations for deburring and a little bit of finishing. Uh, so, I mean, pretty well just for finishing. Sawing's real common. You see saw a lot of sawing nowadays. Broaching you see a lot. You know, filing you pretty well just, just see for finishing operations. So, uh, they make power filing machines. Uh, but they're pretty rare. There's a disk file here. I, I've never seen one of those things, uh, just in pictures. Uh, band file like this. Again, I've never never seen one. Uh, yeah, the, the sort of you know from an older day of machining when so much wasn't done CNC. I mean, pretty well nowadays in manufacturing, you want everything to be computer controlled and. 
uh, you can get most of your geometry in, in the machine and you don't have to sit there and hand finish a lot of things. Unless you've got a tool making shop, something like that. Uh, you don't do a lot of this. You don't do a lot of hand, hand operations. There's still people that do that and they might have some crazy old machines like this. But in, in mass production, which most of you guys are going to go into businesses that do some level of production, you usually stay away from things like this and do more more automated techniques and let the finishing be done by computer-controlled machines. Uh, rotary burr, same thing. You know, Back in the days when they were making dies out of steel by hand, uh, die grinding, which is literally why it's called die grinding, uh, it, it was more of a thing, you know. Now you use little burrs like this to touch parts up. You don't, you just don't see them in mass production because it's it's a hand operation that's done slowly by time. You know, it takes time. It's expensive. Uh, in mass production, you know, for something like this, you CNC machine it, and you wouldn't really need to come back in with the burr and clean something up. But you know, for one-off parts and tool making, uh, maybe making some one-off dies, you might might need to use burrs. Uh, or for home shop operations or small shop, you know, if you're in a building cylinder heads and trying to clean ports on cylinder heads, you might use burrs like this. So, uh, you know, those of you on design teams who use stuff like this all the time because you're doing making one car or or one Mars rover. You know, if you're making a thousand Mars rovers, you're you're not going to sit there and die grind a bunch of parts on it. So, uh, anyway, that's it for today. Uh, thank you all, and I will see you next.